Mm -hmm. I hope you didn't suffer too much. That my favorite aspect of the course was that you would use the word seven. You give an example of a number. So you'd say a, a certain field number times a vector. Well, let's call it seven. So seven times a vector would be so-and-so. You know, it can get to extremes, right? You may end up doing things like uh, the limit of uh, e to the minus seven as uh, seven goes to infinity uh, is equal to whatever it is, zero, right? Anyway, yes. What's your field of research? Uh, not theory and uh, from a very algebraic perspective and uh, related uh, algebra things. It used to be uh, much more not theory and quantum field theory, and it slowly, slowly moved to, to being much more algebraic and the relationship with quantum field theory became more and more remote. Okay, what's the relationship, let's forget about the remoteness, what's the close relationship between not theory and quantum field theory? Ooh, it's a bit hard to explain and somewhat surprising and that why that's why it took uh, a, a long time to discover. Let me give you two answers that are somewhat unrelated. And uh, one answer is that quantum field theory is about particles. Uh, and uh, not theory is surprisingly also about the motion of particles. So, uh, you know, let's draw a simple-minded knot. Uh, so, by the way, is this uh, visible, my screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here is a simple-minded knot. It's actually the so-called trefoil knot, but, uh, well, whatever it is. Uh, now, uh, what you can do is you can, uh, so it, it's living in, in, in R3, and uh, I could set up my coordinates so that uh, this coordinate will be called T, maybe you want to call it Z, but you know, I like to call it T uh, 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 right now, and the two coordinates here are X and Y. And then I can slice this knot at uh, equal time uh, slices. So basically I uh, draw a plane which lives at some fixed height, so at an equal, an, an equal time plane, and slice the knot, and then the slice is four points. And as I move these points, in time, so as I move the slice in time, the points move, and they actually do a little lovely dance. And uh, the dance is as follows. So if we call these points uh, A, B, C, and D, then they start at a certain uh, position, A, B, C, and D, right? And then, as I move, uh, well, you can see that C and B trade places. So they play a dance, they somehow dance around each other. Uh, uh, B goes this way and C goes that, sorry, B goes uh, one way and C goes the other way. And after a little while, they trade places. So you have A, C, sorry, A, uh, C, B, D. And as you move the plane even farther, they trade places again. So uh, again, you will have uh, A, B, uh, C, D. And if you move a little farther, again, they trade places. So you have A, C, B, D. And then something funny happens. Uh, uh, points, uh, well, points, well, by this time, this is point B is over here and point C is over here, and points A is here and D is here, 
And what happens is that point C moves towards point D and mm -hmm. point A mo moves to point, point B and they coincide. And when they coincide, they annihilate each other because if you look at the plane which is above the, the level of the knot, um, uh, uh, you no longer see any points. So what happens next is that these points move towards each other, these points move to each other, they meet and bang, they annihilate, and after that, there is an empty set. And in fact, I started at height, uh, at a certain height, had I started below, I start with the empty set, and instead of annihilation of pairs, you get a creation of pairs. So a pair of points get created here and a pair of points get created here, and then they perform this nice dance. So this was this particular knot, but the same story is true for every knot. Every knot can be written as a certain dance of points in which uh, sometimes pairs get created, sometimes pair meet and annihilate each other, and in between these times, they all dance. Anyway, uh, physics in general is about the motion of particles, and it's not too surprising that there is a relationship. Physics also sees things like creation and, and annihilation of pairs of particles, and I mean, so again, it's not so surprising. But this is very, very, very loose. And, gee, the other explanation I can give you is even more loose. Uh, but even, but, but in some sense, more um, closer to the truth. Uh, well, okay, maybe you've heard that quantum mechanics is related to path integrals. So, uh, you know, in classical mechanics, uh, you know, if a path goes from point A to point B, sorry, if a particle goes from point A to point B, it goes along a specific path. Um, in quantum mechanics, it has a probability of going uh, from A to B, and you compute this probability by doing a certain integral over the space of all paths. So the particle, or I, I, I mean, I'm, again, even, even my interpretation of quantum mechanics here is a bit loose because interpreting quantum mechanics is, is a very hard thing. Uh, but with this loose interpretation, you uh, sum over all probabilities of going this way or that way or that way or that way, and by adding up all these probabilities, or more precisely, integrating over the space of all, all of those probabilities, or more precisely, phase factors or, or um, amplitudes, uh, you, you can compute the probability of going from A to B. That's quantum mechanics. Now, uh, uh, likewise, quantum field theory, but in quantum field theory, it, it's essentially the same, except the integrals are more complicated. But the point is that already these integrals are not like integrals over Rn, right? Rn is uh, the collection of n tuples of points, a1 up to an. So a point in Rn is determined by in real numbers. Whereas a function, the space we are integrating over now, is the space of all functions. And a function is determined by infinitely many real values. You need to know the value of the function here, the value of the function here, the value of the function here, the value of the function here. Of the function here. So to determine a function, you need to know infinite, infinitely many uh, real numbers. So the integral that you end up doing is not 157 style, sorry, now I'm using a, a, a Toronto style language, or it's not one variable calculus in integral, which is, again, one variable uh, integral. It's not this. 
it's not second year calculus when right. you do n variable uh, integrals. It's infinite dimensional, so infinitely many variables integration. This is what we need. Okay? So, uh, quantum field theory ended up developing a bag of techniques for computing infinite dimensional integrals. And what these techniques are is a whole different story. But, uh, but, but quantum field theory ended up doing this. And then uh, it turns out that infinite dimensional integrals are useful to topology. So, so the, 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 the way that quantum field theory becomes useful in topology is indirect. It's not that the quantum field theory itself is useful. Even this is a lie, because sometimes the quantum field theory itself is useful. But the, but the main path by which quantum field theory becomes useful to topology is not uh, uh, direct, but a bit indirect. Quantum field theory developed a bag of techniques, and this bag of techniques applies elsewhere. Uh, anyway, why are infinite dimensional integrals useful to topology? Um, the answer is, again, a bit uh, complicated, but let me try to summarize it. So let me bring a knot. Here's a knot. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, well, actually, that's not a knot. Why not? Okay, what I'm showing you is a curve in R3. A knot is... Uh, a, 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 an equivalence class of such curves. So this is a curve. If I deform it a bit, it's still a curve, but it's considered the same knot. If I deform it some more, it's still a curve, but, it cons but, 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 but it's the same knot. So a knot is not a single curve, but an equivalence class of curves. Now, suppose you want quantities that are associated to knots. You want to be able to tell knots apart, so you need quantities uh, that would be computable from the knots and that you would use them to tell the knots apart. Okay? Now, it's very easy to compute quantities that are associated with curves. So if you have a curve, uh, you can measure it's how much it bends, so the radius of, of, of the bending, okay? Again, these things have technical names, the curvature, maybe the torsion. There are various names for, for various quantities you can associate with cor curves. So, you know, I can look at the maximal curvature of this knot, of this curve, and the maximal curvature will be the place where it turns the most, and that's probably around here for this particular curve, around here, okay? Now, um, uh, but that quantity is a quantity which is associated with curves. It's a useless as a quantity for knots. It's useless as a quantity for knots because if we're talking about knots, you know, I could deform it and the maximal curvature could go somewhere else, could change could grow, could shrink, could differ. Right. So the way to get quantities that are associated with knots rather than with curves is to integrate over the space of all geometries. So instead of picking the quantity for a specific geometric manifestation of the knot, you yep. integrate over the space of all geometries, and then the result will be a, a quantity associated with the knot. Unfortunately, the examples are very, very hard. So, you know, the, the, the famous example, the example that uh, uh, got written, uh, well, one of the examples that got written very, very famous in topology or among mathematicians is the so-called uh, Chern-Simons theory, 
uh, or Chern Simons quantity, which is um, uh, some uh, in itself some integral. So you integrate over R3. So the quantity itself is a finite dimensional integral, right? So you integrate over R3 something called the Chern Simons form. Uh, which is something called, which is A wedge DA plus two thirds uh, A wedge A wedge A, whatever that is. But this is, you know, related to stuff appearing in second year uh, multivariable calculus in the most advanced versions. Okay, so wedge products and differential forms and exterior derivatives and stuff like that. Then you take this quantity and you multiply it by i, multiply by k, exponentiate it, multiply by another quantity, the so-called holonomy along the knot of a, whatever that is. So I'm throwing names because I really have no choice because giving the precise definition is a matter for a graduate class. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and this is the quantity that you associate with a geometric knot. And then to get an invariant of knots or to get a quantity associated with the knot itself, you integrate it over the space of all such A's. And I think I, I can really tell you what these A's are, but it's an infinite dimensional space. So uh, I guess I haven't really answered your question by giving an example, but I just told you the examples are hard. Okay. Anyway, um, well, they're hard, but they're exactly of the nature that uh, physics knows how to study or that quantum field theory developed techniques to study. And so one can study it using quantum field theory techniques and get all sorts of, um, um, well, quantities relevant to not, relevant to not. The so-called Jones polynomial is an example, and then there are many other examples. If you read the Bible with letter skips, if you read every tenth letter, uh, you will occasionally find a word. Mm -hmm. That's not surprising. But the claim was that these words were... that, that, it, that it actually happens more than statistics would... Uh, predict and that these words have messages in them mm -hmm. and uh, and there was a group of people in uh, Jerusalem that published a paper and in fact it passed peer review uh, but uh, so so they published a paper in which they uh, supposedly proved this fact they did careful statistical analysis, again, careful in quotes, uh, and, 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 and showed that the effect was real. And therefore, the Bible uh, must have been written by God because no human could have put this information into the Bible. It's, informa it's in information that was not, did not even exist at the time that the Bible was written. And therefore, in per and, and so, so God wrote the Bible. Uh, furthermore, it's the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so there is a God, and that God loves Hebrew more than she loves uh, Japanese. I understand, yeah. Uh, you know, th th this would be the greatest discovery. In, if, if it was true, it would have been the greatest discovery in the history of science. And I'm not kidding. Right? I mean, there's no longer an argument between atheism and theism. Theism wins. My role was to debunk this. Is this real life or not? I don't know. I, me and a group of people read critically these assertions that, got, that, that were good enough that they passed peer review in a respectable journal, and we found gaps. And the gaps are well, we're good enough that the same peer-reviewed journal accepted our paper too. Okay, so, you know, in some sense, my role was negative, right? Uh, what could have been the greatest discovery in the history of science, a proof that there is God and it's the Hebrew God, 
was debunked. Maybe it's a negative discovery, but well, I mean, if, maybe my effect, well, my part was negative. I've killed a great discovery. But that's also a, a, a valuable thing to do, I mean, to kill a... Uh, the other thing is, uh, otherwise, mathematics plays an extremely limited role in my life. Other than my professional life, if you, ex if you cut out uh, the eight hours a day that I work on mathematics, mathematics has no role in my life or hardly any role. So, I mean, you do. And in fact, also almost no role in your life. So basically, you, you know, if you, um, uh, you give change in restaurants, you, uh, so, so, or in, in shops, sorry, you add 15% tip, uh, that's about the math you need in real life. Multiplication you don't need, uh, but, uh, but uh, if you're a carpenter, you probably need it, right? You need to uh, tile, a, you know, if you're a trade person, you need to tile a certain room. Uh, this, the room is five by six. Right, right. How many tiles do you need? So multiplication trade people need, but, 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 but people like me don't need. Um, trigonometry, well, maybe architects need, trig architect need tri trigonometry. Some parts of engineering, and we get more and more esoteric, need higher and higher mathematics. Without the very high mathematics, without general relativity, GPS satellites wouldn't work. So in some sense, we use mathematics every day. But we're not the engineers who design GPS satellites. GPS satellites were designed by a group of, a very small group of people somewhere in some, you know, design bureau. And they use high level mathematics. So, 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 but my real life high level mathematics is almost nothing, except once, sorry, the Bible codes and another time, and I've given talks with this title. So uh, the title was uh, The Hardest uh, Mathematics uh, I've uh, Ever Really. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you Google this title, probably you'll be able to find a video of that talk. And you'll find a one time where it was actually in my professional life, but in a meta way. So not my research, but something about how to present my research. I ended up using uh, very high level mathematics, hyperbolic geometry, in fact. So one time it happened. Anyway, what was your next question? Why does it take 360 pages of abstruse symbols to prove that one plus one equals two. Occam's razor says we can cut this. We can just say one plus one equals two because every single last one of us believes it does. So what do you make of that? Why is it so complex to prove something simple like one plus one equals two? Do we even need that? And this question comes from Roy Dobson. So, uh, let me answer, in the, let, let me answer a, a, a different question. Uh, you know, so 1 plus 1 equals 2. So, the, the, the reference is probably to uh, work of uh, Russell. Um, basically, If your axiom system is very, very, very basic and, um, and very, very um, primitive in a way, very, very simple-minded, and you want your axiom system to be very, very, very basic, then it might be that even proving 1 plus 1 equal 2 would be difficult but it will be a part of the build-up. And later you will be uh, proving harder things. And, uh, but the truth is that it's silly. 
Okay, but let me give you an, an, another example. Okay, so, uh, you know, there is the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem says uh, that if you have a function, continuous function, so right. if f is continuous and it's negative here and positive here, then at some point it crosses zero. Uh, we teach it in week seven, maybe, I don't know, of undergraduate calculus. Maybe it's just week five or maybe it's week nine. I don't remember, okay? You can ask, this is so idiotic. Right. Why, why does it take five or seven weeks to prove the obvious that if you go continuously from here to here, you'll be crossing zero? And the answer is that when you prove the intermediate value theorem, you are not actually proving the intermediate value theorem. You are actually testing your definition of continuity. You're testing your <laughs> abstract setup. You're testing your abstract setup, your, your language. You're testing... Uh, you know, the, the, the machinery of for every epsilon there exists a delta such that blah, blah, blah. If you could not prove the intermediate value theorem, you'd be rejecting the abstract system, not the intermediate value theorem. You'd be rejecting this, not that. So the seven weeks were not about the intermediate value theorem. They were about this. For every epsilon, there exists delta. And then you can ask, what's for every epsilon there exists delta for? Why do we need this? Well, we don't need it to prove the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem was testing this. What do we need it for? And the answer is, well, there are later things like uh, e to the x is equal to sum of x to the n divided by n factorial which is, this by the way, looks innocent and people think they understand it, but it's actually a miracle. And this miracle depends or well, doesn't depend, but I mean, there are maybe, maybe other ways to reach there, but, but, but you, you will believe this miracle, miracle after you've understood this system. So, uh, so the answer is, uh, in, in a way, we didn't go from uh, uh, here to here to here, but more like this was known, it validated this, and then uh, we could use it to do other things. The podcast is now finished. If you'd like to support conversations like this, then do consider going to patreon.com slash C-U-R-T.